Hi and welcome to Terry Dogs Movies. This time around I've got something a little bit different. Last Wednesday I did a talk at Kensington Town Hall about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It was for a discussion group called the Nova Mob, which is a science fiction discussion group here in Melbourne, which meets monthly. Somebody gives a talk, we discuss it, people get thanked, you have tea and coffee. You go to the pub around the corner beforehand, if you're so inclined, and have a dinner. The pub's got some interesting um, condom machines in the men's room too. So all of it's a, it's a social thing. We did it by Zoom during the lockdowns and there's still a component of it which is broadcast via Zoom so that people in other places or who can't get to the meeting can be part of it and be interactive with it. So it's all very high tech these days. Been going for a very long time and I've got to thank Murray who's in charge of the Nova Mob and who with his wife Natalie organises it all. It's very congenial, it's very fun. Uh, you get a whole bunch of different people, authors and fans and reviewers and things like that doing uh, the monthly talks. And this time around they asked me to. Now I don't know whether it was because most of the people who go to the Nova Mob were on the other side of the planet this week going to the World Science Fiction Convention in Glasgow. But it turned out to be really nice. It was appreciated. It went well. And I've got the talk here on a teleprompter in front of me. And then we got to inflict it on you. It's basically a history of Marvel and the MCU, with particular reference to the MCU. Did a lot of research on it. So let's get started. It's called the MCU. The MCU, more correctly known as the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is a phenomenon in the history of motion pictures unlike any other. With 36 cinema movies either made or in production, the MCU has made over $30 billion in the global box office since Iron Man first hit the screens in 2008. To put the money in a context you can understand, that's enough cash to buy everyone on the planet a coffee and a biscuit in a Ligon Street cafe. And that's before you calculate merchandise sales. So why and how did this happen? How did a marginalised and juvenile fantastical form of storytelling take over the planetary cinematic zeitgeist? There are a few different factors at play, some of which didn't exist in the past and only hit when the Marvel Cinematic Universe began. But before I go into that, all superhero narratives start with an origin story. And here is the origin story of Marvel. <laughs> In 1939, Timely Comics was created by a publisher called Martin Goodman. It was a good time to start a superhero comic book company. Two years before, in 1937, Superman premiered in Action Comics No. 1. And just five months before Timely's first release, Batman was created in Detective Comics No. 37. Following the DC model, Timely invented their own team of heroes, a vigilante called the Angel, the original android version of the Human Torch, and Namor the Submariner. They also had a speedster hero called the Wizard, but his name hasn't aged particularly well. In 1940, after America realised a world war was going on, Tom Lee also came up with Captain America for Captain America Comics No. 1, which appeared in March 1941. This is a number of months before Pearl Harbor. The cover of the first issue of Captain America was a great image of Cap punching Hitler. Coincidentally, Captain America was also the first timely all-Marvel hero to appear on the big screen. Three years later, in 1944, Republic Pictures released a 15-chapter movie serial of Captain America. It starred Dick Purcell as a district attorney called Grant Gardner, who fights crime in a costume as Captain America. There's no super soldier serum, there's no Steve Rogers punchy out an unsuccessful watercolour painter, there's no Red Skull, there's no Bucky, there's none of that. The villain of the movie serial is a scientist called Dr. Maldor, who is trying to get hold of two high-tech weapons that were recently embedded in the story. A thing called the Electronic Firebolt, which I like the name of, and a second weapon, the Dynamic Vibrator. Remember the Dynamic Vibrator because Dr. Maldor was played by Lionel Atwill, a character actor who had a great career until 1942. In 1942, 
The police arrested him for having an orgy in his home in Hollywood and for showing porno movies to his friends. How times have changed. Atwell's career nosedived in the big studios blacklisted him, which was why he was playing Dr. Maldor in a cheap movie serial. But that's not the weird part of the Captain America movie serial. The running time of the serial was, in total, 243 minutes, and that required a lot of the leading actor. There was lots of running, jumping, punching and heroing, and Dick Purcell wasn't a stuntman or an athlete, he was just a beefy kind of actor. A few weeks after he finished filming the serial, Dick Purcell died of a heart attack in the locker room of a country club after playing a round of golf. So it can be argued that the first ever Marvel movie killed its leading actor. This may be why there wasn't another movie made based on a Marvel character for another 42 years. In 1951, timely rebranded as Atlas Comics, and then in 1961 it became Marvel Comics. That brings us up to 1986 and a movie made by Universal Pictures and a guy called George Lucas. Lucas was heady with the success of a previous movie series that skimmed the good bits off many better works of science fiction. And Lucas decided to make How the Duck, a movie based on the comic book, which was very cool with hipsters at the time. And it was a very bad movie, and it included implied bestiality and a villain played by an actor who later was revealed to be a pedophile. After How the Duck Tank, nothing happened with Marvel movies for another 12 years, unless you count. Roger Corman's completed but never released Fantastic Four movie, which was made in 1994. You can find that movie on YouTube if you look around, and it's better than you might think. New Line Cinema got Blade, an action franchise about a half vampire vampire killer played by Wesley Snipes. The first movie was directed by Stephen Norrington, and it got turned into a trilogy of more or less successful movies from 1998 to 2004. Blade 2 was directed by an up-and-coming Mexican director, Guillermo del Toro. But the third movie, Blade Trinity, turned to crap because Wesley Snipes couldn't be stuffed with the whole franchise and spent most of his time on set smoking dope in his trailer, allegedly. There were other productions. 20th Century Fox got the X-Men and in 2000 made the first of nine movies, which raked in enormous profits for them. They also got Daredevil, a very popular Marvel comic, and made that into a movie with Ben Affleck in 2002, which was not a very popular movie. There was a Demi sequel to that, Elektra, in 2005, starring Jennifer Garner, but those two movies just didn't do well and there was no follow-up on that. They also grabbed the Fantastic Four as a property and made two movies in 2005-2007 which weren't as popular as the studio wanted. In 2003, Universal produced the Ang Lee-directed Hulk, a movie which had been in production hell since 1990, the same year when Bill Bixby stopped playing the Hulk on television. And for me, Hulk is an incredibly underrated movie. It's much, much, much better than most people say. Columbia and Sony got Spider-Man and all of his ancillary characters and villains. And in 2002, they made the first movie with the character directed by Sam Raimi. And to this day, they retain ownership of that intellectual property. By 2005, Marvel Entertainment was looking for a way to bring as many of the properties back in-house as possible and to keep most of the money that was being generated by the properties they actually owned. The studios were making a lot of money, Marvel wasn't. The head of Marvel Entertainment, Avi Ara, wasn't happy with the deals Marvel had made previously, so he formed Marvel Pictures. At first they planned to deal with Paramount Studios, where Marvel would make the movies themselves, and Paramount would release and distribute them. Avi Arad's assistant was a guy called Kevin Feige, and he was not only a genius at this kind of thing, but a complete Marvel fanboy. Feige realised that Marvel still owned all the rights to the Avengers, and literally hundreds of their storylines. Using the Avengers comics as a template, Feige planned a movie series unlike any other. He decided to make a number of individual movies with different heroes and give their origin stories, and then cross them over into a blockbuster team-up, in the same way the comic books have been doing since at least the early 1960s. Marvel Pictures went to the banks and raised half a billion dollars in funding. And in 2006, Feige became the head of the studio, and he still is. In 2008, Marvel Pictures made Iron Man. Strangely enough, an Iron Man movie had been on Hollywood's radar since at least 1990, when Universal still owned the rights to the character. At one stage, Nicolas Cage wanted to make it, then Tom Cruise. In the late 90s, Quentin Tarantino was approached to make it, but declined. 
Scripts were being written and rejected right up to 2005 when Marvel got the rights back from Universal. Marvel scrapped all the previous work on Iron Man and approached at least 30 writers to do a new script. All of them declined the offer. John Favreau was brought in to direct. Now, Favreau had previously worked on the Daredevil movie as an actor. And like Feige, he was a comic book geek. Favreau and Feige decided they wanted to do Iron Man's origin story, updating it and leaning hard on Tony Stark's epiphany. They were fascinated by the change in the way Stark saw the world when he was directly impacted by his family's arms-making enterprises. Marvel started thinking about who could play Tony Stark slash Iron Man. At first they thought Jim Caviezel, and then Timothy Oliphant, and Sam Rockwell. They were all considered. Forever I met with Robert Downey Jr., who had just made a successful comeback with a movie called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And he knew that Downey was right for the role. Robert Downey Jr.'s real life paralleled Tony Stark's. He'd been a successful and supremely gifted actor who had drug and alcohol abuse issues. He spent some time in jail and became the punchline of late night talk show monologues. But RDJ had done the hard things and finally got his shit together. The movie was made and the post credit sequence telegraphed the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury surprising Stark in his mansion and announcing the Avengers initiative. On a budget of $140 million, Iron Man made Marvel $585 million. The next movie they made was The Incredible Hulk, starring the poorly chosen Edward Norton as Bruce Banner. This was one of Marvel Pictures' first WTF problems. Norton wanted the movie to be like the 1980s television series starring Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrino. Feige disagreed they had arguments about it. Norton didn't understand what Marvel was trying to do. He seemed to just want the nostalgic buzz for his favourite childhood TV show. Much later, when it came time for Banner and Hulk to reappear again in 2012's The Avengers, Edward Norton was out and Mark Ruffalo was in. Next up, Marvel produced Iron Man 2, where another problematic actor from the first movie, Terrence Howard, who had played Stark's friend James Rhodes, was replaced by Don Cheadle. We then got Thor, directed by Kenneth Branagh, which brought the God of Thunder into the MCU in the form of newcomer Chris Hemsworth. That was followed up with Captain America the First Avenger, partly a World War II movie. And it starred Chris Evans as Steve Rogers. Evans knew his way around superhero movies. He'd been in at least three of them before. The two Universal Fantastic Four movies and an unbranded superhero movie called Push in 2009. In 2012, Phase 1 of the MCU culminated with the Avengers and the whole world went crazy for it. Meanwhile, back in December 2009, Disney bought Marvel for $4 billion, which was a bargain. By that stage, the MCU was already one of the most successful movie franchises in history. In the years between then and now, the MCU expanded in every direction, from the comedic space operas of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies to the fascinating Afrofuturism of Black Panther and Black Panther Wakanda Forever. We got the East Asian wuxia magic of Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings, the slightly tongue-in-cheek Ant-Man movies with Paul Rudd, the five years too late Black Widow film, and even the Sony crossovers that temporarily brought Spider-Man in the form of Tom Holland into the MCU. The MCU was something unique in cinema. It created a vast universe, a mosaic of individual stories that when put together formed a much larger narrative and picture. So far we've had five phases of the MCU, with the sixth starting in 2025. These phases tell meta stories in a way that paralleled and expanded on the idea in the 1944 Captain America, which told its story in 15 parts. The MCU worked because like the old movie serials, which were shown one episode per week in local cinemas, the MCU and Marvel had faith in the audience showing up for the next instalment. The movie serials knew their audience would show up next week to see the next episode to find out how the cliffhangers resolve themselves. What else were you going to do in 1944? Television wasn't around and people frowned on premarital sex. The five phases of Marvel's narrative have been conglomerated into two larger sagas. The Infinity Saga, which ended with the monolithically successful Avengers Endgame, and the ongoing Multiverse Saga, which allows Marvel to, to bring back the Fantastic Four and the X-Men into the company tent. 
This was possible because in 2019, Disney took over Fox Studios, who previously had the rights. However, Feige and Marvel haven't had it all their own way. Chadwick Boseman, who played T'Challa, the King of Wakanda, in Black Panther, died of cancer in 2020. The choice not to recast that role has been controversial ever since, but Marvel stuck to its guns and made Black Panther Wakanda Forever in 2023, which may be the ultimate Afro-futuristic movie made anywhere so far. We also got Eternals, Thor Love and Thunder, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and the Marvels, all of which didn't particularly hit well with audiences for a number of reasons. Eternals, based on an idea and comic series by Jack Kirby, was too ambitious and too different. It introduced 10 new heroes in one go. It covered a vast amount of time from ancient human history to the modern era. And there wasn't a familiar character in sight. Taika Waititi's Thor Love and Thunder, the fourth Thor movie, was a smug vanity project that did nothing to advance the story of the God of Thunder and seemed to have been made so that Chris Hemsworth and Taika Waititi could put their kids in a movie. Now, I liked Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness in spite of many people not, but then I dig Doctor Strange. The fanboys didn't like the Marvels because it was full of female characters and the fanboys hadn't watched the prequel series Ms. Marvel on Disney+. Plus. And Man of the Wasp Quantumania was just bad and clearly the special effects were rushed and therefore not that good. Quantum Mania also introduced a character who was going to be the big bad of Marvel's Phase 6, Kang the Conqueror. Played by Jonathan Majors, Kang was the Genghis Khan of the multiverse, an emperor who ruled many times and timelines in many manifestations, and who could manipulate time on a macro and micro scale. He was a genuinely awe-inspiring and terrifying villain. Unfortunately, Jonathan Majors was charged with domestic abuse offences and Marvel released him from their multiverse and his contract. A similar thing happened with another actor, Teda Cuerta, who played Namor, the King of the Underwater Kingdom of Tulakan, in Black Panther Wakanda Forever. The other problem the MCU was cursed with was that people weren't going to the movies as much, partly due to a weird accident in a wet market in Wuhan in 2019. After all these missteps, Marvel wisely took a deep breath in 2024 to rethink and replan the future of the monolithic story they were telling. Last month at San Diego Comic-Con, they announced a new slate of movies and the fans went mad. Fantastic Four First Steps is set in an alternative 1960s space age. We have a new Captain America movie, Captain America Brave New World, with Anthony Mackie Sam Wilson as the new Captain America and Harrison Ford as the President of the United States Thunderbolt Ross. There's another production called Thunderbolts, which is a young MCU version of DC Suicide Squad. And then there are the big movies, Avengers Doomsday, with Robert Downey Jr. coming back into the family, not as Tony Stark, but as the MCU's big bad, Victor Von Doom. We're also getting two more movies, Avengers Secret War and Armor Wars. So why is the MCU so ubiquitous and so successful? There are a lot of reasons. In 2008, Iron Man hit the screens just as special effects technology matured to the point where anything you can put on a storyboard could be put on a screen photorealistically. Movie making technology had gone way past green screens and stop motion giant gorillas. Social media also accelerated at that time. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and all their bastard children became fantastic avenues for promoting movies and for people to discuss, enthuse, speculate and argue about. The immense fan base of comic book and action movie geeks could, for the first time, stand up on their individual digital soapboxes and shout about their passions and opinions to the world. That widened the bandwidth of awareness for these movies and the ancillary series, specials, one-offs and merchandise. Marvel used this social media tsunami to boost the signal even further. No studio in movie history does publicity as well as Marvel under the Disney umbrella. Yes, there are concerns about the monopoly of Disney-related media, and yes, they are valid. Disney doesn't play well with others, it never has. And Disney's middle American cultural bias is still the toxic, malodorous, lingering legacy of Walt Disney. But take it alone, the MCU fascinates me. This kind of bold, enormously upscaled storytelling 
is something that novels and comics have done for over half a century, but never before had it been tried in cinema. I don't know what the Marvel Endgame is, and that's a pun. Nobody does. We've never seen anything like this in cinema before. There are no maps. The MCU, including the series, has given us space operas, political thrillers, personal dramas, magical fantasies, office-based comedies, courtroom thrillers, Afrofuturism, more movies, urban noir crime series, and even private eye stories. Superhero narratives can be as varied as any other form of fiction. And at this moment in time, nobody does it better than Marvel does. Some people say the public is suffering from superhero fatigue. I don't believe in superhero fatigue. Storytelling is storytelling. Nobody talks about crime fiction fatigue, or romance fiction fatigue, or hentai fatigue. There's a snobbery to the attitude some people have to superhero movies. And that amplifies when these movies become either very successful, or when they fail. Any kind of story can be told against the background of superhuman beings. And I hope we get many, many more of them. Marvel and DC have more than 80 years of continuous, parallel, monthly storytelling to mine for future movies. That's a mind-boggling and exciting back catalogue. I want to see this much more than I want to see the endless alien movies that are replaying the highlights of a 1979 haunted house film set in space. And I like it better than all of those vain and earnest attempts to broaden the simplistic binary morality of the Star Wars universe to try to elicit the same buzz from the audience that they felt when they were seven years old. I want new stories and new voices, new ideas and new wonders. I also want unloved Marvel characters like Deathlock the Demolisher and Machine Man and Kazar who's still around in the comics and is the king of the savage land beneath the ice of Antarctica. I want Devil Dinosaur and Fin Fang Foom, the ancient alien dragon. And I want them to bring back Luke Cage in a retro 1970s alternative universe Harlem. The possibilities of Marvel are endless, and they're not going away. And I'm really interested to see where they go from here, because I'm fascinated and somewhat in awe of what they've achieved already. So that's it, that's my talk that I gave at the Nova Mop. It was fun, it was very well received, and I was surprised at how well received it was. And it was a real blast to do. There's nothing quite like a live interactive audience. So that's it for this time around. I've got a live stream that's going to happen on Monday where I'm going to be reviewing the new things from imprint films. There's also going to be a lot of chat and interactive stuff the way there always is with live streams. Looking forward to that a lot. Then we get back into the usual Wednesday video and then Science Fiction Saturday again. And the carousel goes around. So thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, do all of the things. Let me know what you thought of my talk. Because I put a lot of work into it. You can also support the channel by becoming a channel member. Or else by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies. We live in an exciting time for movies. And we live in an exciting time for media in general. And I'm fascinated by new things that, that are happening. And by the way, I've been sent a few things by some subscribers and some supporters of the channel, some movies. And I'll be showing you what they are next Wednesday as well. Uh, we're getting a bit of a community here and, and, the, and the subscriber base is expanding. The number of comments I'm getting is expanding and it's a very cool time to be doing what I'm doing. So until the next time I do something that I enjoy doing, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies, watch some movies with capes and flying people. And I'll catch you next time.